Dr. Piscaglia, uh, dear Simone, it's uh, a pleasure to see you here on this interview. We know each other already for a long time, uh, act in, and you're actively involved in all the QFR issues from Ferrara University. Have been active, actively involved there and, and publishing a lot. And um, yeah, we have selected this particular topic also in the interview to talk in particular about all your uh, experience with the post uh, uh, PCI QFR. But but first of all, for 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 the uh, the participant in the um, in this interview, can you say a little bit about yourself, what you are doing, and and your background? Yeah. Okay. So. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Simone Biscaglia. I work as interventional cardiologist at uh, Ferrara University Hospital. And uh, basically, I'm also a researcher on uh, my, I mean, my main field of research are myocardial infarction setting and patients and uh, coronary artery physiology and uh, imaging. So this is what I'm, I'm happy to do it. And let's talk about it. Yes, excellent. And as we mentioned already, you have um, uh, been so much involved in uh, in certain in, in many things, but also in the post PCI QFR. And, and I think the first study of its kind, including outcome data, was the Hawkeye study, and and that was published in 2019. And now we are two years further down the line. Is there? Uh, and it, it was a, and it is a very interesting study. Is there? new data since the, the two years that, that we have passed? Uh, how, what is the outcome, the further outcome of the data that yeah. we can from? Yeah, actually we have uh, a lot of more data about post-PCI physiology in general and uh, post-PCI QFR in particular. So we started by doing a, a prospective registry that was called, as you said, the OKI. And uh, basically we measured QFR after a successful angiographic PCI in more than 600 patients and this was blinded so actually the operator didn't know about the results of uh, QFR at the time of the procedure and then we wanted to see whether uh, we were able to predict the outcome uh, based on the QFR value post PCI and actually what we found was that uh, yes the answer is yes in brief and that we had uh, a lot of event when QFR was uh, below 0 0.90 and so uh, and this is the i mean the first uh, message but the second message which has been confirmed by also the other studies that uh, have come out afterwards is that not only you are able to predict the outcome with the qfr post pci but uh, if you know it at the moment of the pci you can also understand which is uh, the underlying mechanism of uh, suboptimal results in terms of uh, you know, suboptimal expansion of the stent or uh, uh, an unnoticed lesion proximal or uh, distal uh, to the stented segment or uh, a diffuse disease which cannot be treated with the stent so much. But this is important because in uh, two out of three, in two thirds of the cases, you could uh, have done something about it. And this, I think, can be clinically meaningful. Obviously, we have to prove it with the randomized clinical trials, but uh, I think it's something really interesting for the time being. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, uh, that, that was a great start with the study and you're continuing this, this work. And um, of course it has been well received and yeah, that is, that's really great data. And also that it, it has outcome data, of course, that uh, as you know, also with the FAVOR 3 trial, that is also outcome data, but you're really yeah, based on this post PCI value really uh, you 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 can um, uh, that that gives a good reason to say well if the QFR is below or above 0.91 you need to do something not or you have to do something extra and and look at uh, at the data so it, it, it's very important data. Now we also yeah. see um, and it, it's also actually easy because you don't have, you don't have to do something different from what you do every day because you do at least two projections at the end of your procedure so why not uh, doing uh, the projections for uh, the acquisition it's not something you know uh, that uh, troubles you during the procedure uh, lengthen the procedure is what you do you just have to do the uh, the evaluation with the with the system but it takes uh, two minutes yeah yeah no absolutely 
Now, we also see uh, a, a, a slightly different subject, but of course, you're also PI of the FIRE trial. Uh, and uh, we, so we see very regularly all those uh, newsletters where you are. Uh, you are, I believe, already above the 1,100 patients yeah. out of the 1,400 with, uh, yeah, of course, COVID has a, a negative effect on the, uh, on the inclusion. But I, I believe that you are still, uh, the goal is still to have all patients uh, with 1,400 um, included by maybe uh, June, July of this year. Yeah, and, this and is the idea. Yeah, yeah. And basically, the FIRE trial is a, a randomized clinical trial, as you said, about uh, uh, older MI patients, so patients with at least 75 years uh, of age with multivessel disease. So they are both uh, ST-segment elevation MI and non-ST-segment elevation MI patients with a clear culprit lesion uh, that has to be treated, obviously, with the stent. And then we randomize the non-culprit lesion or lesions to culprit only revascularization or a functional guide PCI. And uh, actually within the trial, you can use uh, whatever system you use in your clinical practice, but a lot of, uh, a lot of centers are actually using QFR. So it's, it will be another interesting data, outcome data, as you say, uh, regarding also the technology. But the idea is to, you know, to include patients that are excluded from, uh, you know, regular, normal, uh, randomized clinical trial, and trying to to answer the question we have in, in our clinical practice, which is what to do with the with these patients that are uh, more and more uh, every year. So yes, as you said, we uh, uh, we enrolled uh, more than uh, 1,100 patients thanks to the unbelievable commitment of the participating centers because. Uh, uh, as you remember, we, we are in the midst of uh, a pandemic, but uh, anyway, all the centers managed to continue to enroll patients, and this is uh, really unbelievable, and we have to thank them for their commitment. We yeah. hopefully will uh, end the enrollment within uh, summer, and then uh, w the one-year follow-up will be one year later, and we yeah. will have the completion of the primary endpoint. Yeah. So, yes. It's an incredible adventure. Yeah, and then hopefully, uh, most likely presentation at uh, uh, hopefully TCT maybe next let's, year. Let's because for it. TTR yeah. will be too early for that. Um, I don't know. I don't know. We will see. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> surprise, surprise. Yeah. Yeah. No, but that uh, that's great. And all, in, like you say, also so many sites. I think you have uh, 15 sites in Italy, 10 in Spain. Yeah. And a uh, number of slides in, in Poland, but altogether uh, 35 to 40 sites are really participating in the trial. And, and, and congratulations uh, also on these nice newsletters. It's very stimulating. <laughs> it makes these very nice to, to stimulate the participants to, uh, to enroll uh, more and more patients in the, in the trial. Thank you. And, and then recently, I also uh, saw this paper in Jack Interventions, eh, where you had the subtitle, um, Another Step Towards Precision Medicine. And, and there you also propose the, uh, the physiologic assessment post-PCI should be done on a regular basis to improve the patient outcome. And, and indeed, in, with a very nice uh, flow diagrams, you, you, you propose a certain workflow for the various physiologic approaches and, and the possible post-PCI next steps. It's not only for QFR, but also for FFR or IFR. But I think that is a, a, a very nice uh, a paper in Jack Interventions. And um, I'm, I'm sure you get a lot of uh, reactions also uh, based on this particular patient. So can you comment uh, further on this? Yeah, the idea of the state-of-the-art review was to summarize because uh, actually a lot of work has been published uh, on uh, the subject so on post pci physiology and uh, actually with all uh, different tools we are uh, able to use in our clinical practice nowadays so the idea was first to summarize data and uh, but also to give the to the operators very practical messages about uh, what to do when you have uh, abnormal physiology but because uh, it's not uh, just of uh, measuring it, but, just, but to action on it when you have uh, suboptimal physiological results. So the idea was to, to show that it's possible to react on uh, abnormal coronary physiology post-PCI 
and to show also some examples on, of different mechanism and of uh, different actions uh, needed to acquire the best physiological results for the patient, which is, uh, as we know, associated with outcome. So the idea was the first this one, and the secondly, to show that actually you can do in most of your procedures, if not all of them, because if you perform uh, physiology before PCI in order to assess whether a vessel has to be treated, obviously you can use the same uh, tool to, to measure physiology afterwards. But if you didn't do it straight away to because it wasn't needed or uh, you didn't want to do it uh, at first, uh, you can do it always afterwards, uh, and I think that angio-based FFR, QFR in particular, is particularly appealing in this setting because, as as we said before, you don't need a wire, you don't need the drugs, adenosine, and so on. So actually, it's just a matter of doing two projection and uh, analyze them. So actually, if you merge, you know, all this, the the tools we have, uh, the utilization of all the, of all the tools we have in clinical practice, I think that uh, the penetration of uh, post-PCI physiology could be really higher than what is right now. Yeah. And we try to make our point about it. Yeah, no, yeah, very well received. And of course, there have been some um, different groups have found a little different uh, threshold. Uh, I believe you also started out with 0.89, if I'm not believe, uh, Patrika, I believe, had something like 0.91. So is it now the threshold that in general 0.90, is that generally accepted? Uh, I mean, it doesn't make a, a lot of difference whether it's 0.89 or 0.91, I guess, but you use also 0.90 now as a threshold? Less than 0.90, because okay. in the in the OKI was less or equal to 0.99, so actually it's much more of this, it's quite the same. But uh, I think that the most important thing is not about a single value threshold, but uh, about the, the fact that you have to measure it and then if you have 0 0.89 or 0 0.91, it's not that different, you have to assess uh, if you can do something about it uh, and then and then work on it because the, the, higher, the higher value you have post-PCI, the better is the prognosis of the patient. So, I mean, the threshold is important, but I don't think that is the most important thing we have uh, to, to keep in mind, but to, to do physiology and to understand uh, what it says to us and what it's, uh, it suggests to us to do and, and act on it. This yeah. is, my, I mean, yeah. my idea. Uh, you have, of course, a, a lot of experience with the QFR. You mentioned it's just two minutes. Is that also in, in your, your, your practical time that you need? So just two minutes, you take two views, you do the analysis, and then in two minutes you're done at the average? Yeah, you have actually to, to, to work in, in an assessment that uh, enabled to, you to do it. So actually you have to to be connected from the, the system to the angiogram and then have a, have a direct transportation of the images from one to the other. And then actually when you sit at the computer and you perform the analysis, it's really less than two minutes because uh, if, you go, if you do a good angiography and then you don't have to make a correction to the system, the system is pretty straightforward. So actually, the, the system takes one minute and then you may spend one more minute just to look whether there are issues or the, the vessel is well designed and so on. But uh, actually, once you start doing it, you, sh you, you will find that it's uh, easy and fast. Actually, yeah. This is my experience. Yeah. Uh, and in the meantime, uh, as you probably know, we continue to, to make it even more automated and more simpler to use. So then the two minutes should uh, maybe go to uh, one minute or less than one minute as we go from one version to the other. But it's, uh, it's very good to know that in your practice, uh, where you have indeed, of course, a, a lot of experience, that, uh, that it then only takes about, uh, about two minutes. Yeah. Now, recently, there was also this, um, this European uh, journal uh, publication by the group from Dr. Ding and, and, and William Baines from the LAMP Institute in Galway. And, and they also, that was also an overview paper in which the, uh, the clinical significance, again, also of uh, post-PCI success of a coronary intervention was described and, and also the tools 
uh, to um, that can provide real, reliable measures. And here again also um, it demonstrates the great value in that paper of the post PCI physiology and uh, where where do its uh, due to its non-invasive character, the, the QFR should be a very uh, great candidate. Um, any comments on that particular paper that uh, I'm sure you've uh, read and noticed also? Yeah, no, it's a great paper, obviously. Uh, but uh, I think that um, the next step in uh, coronary physiology is uh, to move from, you know, pre or post PCI assessment to actually uh, guidance in uh, PCI. And I think this is uh, really, really important and is what we are trying to do with uh, with our uh, current uh, research projects on the matter, which is not only to guide revascularization in terms of yes, no, you have to stent, no, you have not to stent this lesion, and uh, neither just uh, telling you you have done a good job or you have di you didn't do a good job afterwards, but to tell you before what to do and how to treat the lesion in order to achieve a good functional result. And I think that this kind of, uh, you know, virtual PCI, we can call it in different, uh, with different names, uh, you, you can choose the one you like, but actually this, this kind of, uh, uh, you know, approach to physiology is the future. And I think that, uh, yes, we have also in uh, FFR, we have CPG, we have Delta FFR in Delta Time, but uh, we have the, the, the pullback curve in the QFR, which is really, really good uh, to, this, uh, to this end. But I think that we should start to think about physiology in this way to, to, you know, to map the vessel and to decide what to do with the vessel uh, before, uh, before the starting of the PCI, rather than just to assess the results afterwards. And yeah. I think this is a really interesting, uh, is an interesting development of the uh, field and also of the technology of QFR because for QFR it's uh, much much easier than with other tools to do it and to have uh, the information of uh, uh, e every every millimeter of the vessel actually yeah yeah, yeah and that is um, uh, of course I'd be, be happy to at a later point in time to go in some more detail how you see that and it was also one of my questions uh, uh, what additional measures or features uh, do you need huh, from th either 3D QCA or the uh, QFR pullback? Uh, you're talking about the, the PPG index. You have also recently published uh, another paper where you define it, uh, uh, say, with another name also. But but you see also a lot of value in uh, that's basically the PPG uh, index to to uh, discriminate uh, focal disease and diffuse disease. Indeed, also there are um, yeah, very important uh, uh, parameters and would certainly be very much of interest for us also to learn from your ideas how you see that and, and maybe you need other features uh, or derivatives um, that, that you would like to see in the analysis. So it's something for, I think, uh, uh, future discussions to learn from you how you can further um, yeah, integrate the QFR in your whole say, planning and decision uh, and processes. I think yeah. that would be very interesting. Yeah, I think that as we as we already discussed, I think it's uh, the, the QFR pullback is uh, the, the number one uh, solution for planning the procedure to me because it's really clear. And then you have uh, Bianjo showing you where, which uh, every point, uh, the, the position of every point in the coronary artery in terms of uh, physiological and angiographical uh, uh, anatomy. And this is uh, really good. And you have also the residual vessel QFR uh, value. So you can plan to treat uh, one lesion or another lesion and to see the result. What we could, uh, what could be useful to add is uh, to, to do it also in not in just one lesion, but if you have like three lesions and you have, you want to treat the proximal and distant and to leave the mid one, actually you cannot do, you, you have to sum one value to the other because you can do residual vessel QFR on the proximal and the distal and not on the mid one. Mm -hmm. and this could be an, an interesting uh, add-on on the system actually. Yeah. And yeah. then to, to provide also this uh, uh, quantitative measurement of uh, 
diffuse versus focal disease as a TPG or delta FFR and delta time, which is actually delta space in, in the QFR, which is uh, probably even more accurate. And, uh, and I think that, uh, as you said before, uh, and you, I think you are going in the right direction, all this information should be given to the, pro the operator automatically at at the end of the ANJO. Actually, you should uh, go out uh, through, through the, the cath lab and see just a very beautiful picture of the vessel with the QFR reconstruction and uh, the planning of the procedure or suggestion at least of planning and, uh, and not the numbers of these, uh, of these uh, you know, important measurement yeah, and, yeah. Uh, and work on it. Yeah. Yeah, well, some something to uh, to further discuss at another point in time in some more depth. Uh, if you if uh, you have time for that uh, with our team, that we can certainly learn from from your ideas and at a certain point in time uh, start implementing that and testing it also with you, of course. Absolutely. I think we um, we, we have come uh, to almost uh, say the end of this uh, interview. Um, I, I would like to thank you very much for uh, for your time and and all your uh, interesting uh, observations and discussions, and um, look forward to uh, see additional papers, of course, published by you, plus all the the clinical data from these studies. Uh, we will follow that uh, very closely, and uh, um, yeah, of course, uh, together also putting very much effort in getting also the paper three. <laughs> trial done at a certain point in time because that is for us also as an outcome study of uh, of enormous in, in importance. So Always a pleasure. With that, um, thank you very much, and uh, I look forward to meet with you at another point in time. Thank you. Hopefully soon. Bye. Bye.